Welcome to another tutorial video. This time around, we're going to look at a very specific concept, and I'm going to start by asking a simple but broad question, which is, is EBITDA a useful metric? And so by EBITDA, of course, I'm just referring to earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. It is a very common metric used in valuations, leverage buyouts, and LBO models, credit analysis. But the question today is, is it really accurate or are there problems with it? And if there are problems with it, are there ways to see how accurate it really is? Where I'm going with this question is, remember in some of our previous lessons, we looked at EBITDA versus EBIT versus net income, for example. And we said that the purpose of EBITDA is that it's supposed to be a proxy for core recurring business cash flow from operations before the impact of a company's capital structure and its taxes. So are there cases where this might not hold up and are there ways to detect when this definition might not really apply to a company's EBITDA? And of course the answer is yes. And the solution to this problem is called free cash flow conversion analysis. Here are the problems with EBITDA in short. As I just said, it's supposed to be a proxy for a company's cash flow from operations, because just like with cash flow from operations, depreciation and amortization gets added back and CapEx is excluded. So if you go and look at a company's financials, for example, I've pulled up Foot Locker right here. And when you go to their cash flow statement, I'm just going to Google Finance to look at this. People often argue that EBITDA is similar to cash flow from operations or cash from operating activities, as they call it here, because in both, the major adjustment is adding back depreciation and amortization. And that certainly is the case here. It's the biggest item in the section by far after the company's net income. And for that reason, and for the fact that neither one of these reflects capital expenditures, people often say that EBITDA acts as a proxy for cash flow from operations. Of course, there are some problems with this. First off, what about the fact that cash flow from operations also includes taxes and interest? Because those could both be huge. In this example, since we're starting with net income in cash flow from operations, our net income, of course, includes the company's taxes and if they have any interest income or interest expense, it's also going to include that. So you're not really comparing apples to oranges. And because of those items alone, you are going to see differences between EBITDA and cash flow from operations. Working capital could also really throw things off. Now, in this case, for Foot Locker, working capital is fairly small. But in one of these years, in the fiscal 2013 year, it actually goes up to a much bigger number. And so this is actually a pretty significant portion of the company's net income. And so as a result, if you ignore the change in working capital as you do in the EBITDA calculation, that could also really throw things off. And then finally, with both of these metrics, cash flow from operations and EBITDA, we are completely ignoring capital expenditures. But if you think about it, it's not necessarily a great idea to do it because if you ignore CapEx, you're not getting a real accurate picture of a company's ability to repay debt, for example, because a company has to pay for CapEx as it grows and as it maintains and sustains its operations. So those are a few of the problems with EBITDA. And to get around that, we can look at something called FCF or free cash flow conversion analysis. And the idea is pretty simple. You just look at a company's free cash flow which we define here as cash flow from operations minus capital expenditures. And you look at it as a percent of the company's EBITDA. So here's an example from one of our case studies for seven days in, which is a hotel chain based in mainland China. I'm going to pull up the Excel version of this so you can see it a little bit better. You can see right here that we essentially just start with EBITDA and then we make adjustments to get to the company's free cash flow. So we have to subtract the net interest expense and taxes. That gets us to net income. And then we have to include the other items that are part of cash flow from operations. Non-cash adjustments, the change in working capital. And then 
we subtract capital expenditures to get to free cash flow down here. And then to calculate the conversion, we look at free cash flow as a percent of EBITDA. So here it's very negative in the beginning, but then it turns positive and goes up to around 50 to 60% by the end of our projection period. And the goal is to see how close a company's EBITDA is to its discretionary cash flow. So to give you another example, if we look at it for Foot Locker here, going back to the same company, you can get all this information from Google Finance. You can literally go there and go to their income statement and take the operating income from there and also get the taxes and other information directly from here. And then you can get all the cash flow related items from the cash flow statement that is listed on Google Finance. So I've just input these into Excel and we can take operating income and add DNA from the cash flow statement to get to EBITDA and copy this across. Free cash flow, we can calculate by taking cash flow from operations and subtracting CapEx, copy that across. Or we could get it to it in the same way that we did in the seven days in case study where we start with EBITDA, subtract net interest expense and taxes to get to net income. And then we make these non-cash adjustments and the working capital adjustment, and then we subtract CapEx. So if we do it that way, we get to the same exact numbers that we do up here. We just calculate it a bit differently. And then to calculate free cash flow conversion, we take the free cash flow and divide by the company's EBITDA and copy this across. We can see that it fluctuates quite a bit here from over 60% to down to 30 or 40% to back up to between 50 and 60%. The interpretation here would be that it is fluctuating quite a bit, but if you dig into it and you look at the reasons why, it seems to mostly be caused by the company's changing working capital requirements because EBITDA is increasing each year, net interest expense is staying about the same, taxes are increasing each year, deferred taxes are staying in the same range, other non-cash items are about the same, capital expenditures are increasing each year in tandem with EBITDA. So it really seems to be this massive increase in working capital in year two that caused this. We don't know what's responsible for that. So we need to dig in and see, is it because of a big inventory buildup? Is it because a lot of payments were owed to suppliers? Is it because they're waiting too long to get cash from customers? So we would need to go into that further to see what is really driving this. We'd also have to look at other companies and see how Nike's or Foot Locker's free cash flow conversion compares to theirs and see if it is ahead or behind or in line with them. How do you interpret this beyond what we just mentioned? And the question you're probably wondering is, let's say you have a company that has 100% or over 100% free cash flow conversion. Is that good? And the answer is that, again, it really depends on why it's that high. So for example, if it's sustainable and it's based on very high upfront cash payments from customers, then sure, generally it's a positive sign because if customers are paying you before you have to actually pay to deliver the product or service, or if they're paying you before they even get the product or service, that is almost always a positive because it makes it easier for you to generate cash and to grow the business. On the other hand, if free cash flow conversion is this high because of a one-time tax benefit or because of some other non-recurring item or because of unusual working capital treatment because the company suddenly doesn't need as much inventory or something like that, then it's not so positive. Here are a couple ways you can use free cash flow conversion analysis. First off, you can use it to compare different companies and see which one has the highest free cash flow conversion percentage. I have here an example for HomeAway, which is an internet-based company that provides services similar to Airbnb, where essentially you can rent other people's homes on the site. And in their filings, they actually list their adjusted EBITDA and free cash flow. And you can see how their adjusted EBITDA and free cash flow are very close here. Other people have noted the same thing. And you can find equity research reports. This one's from Barclays, where they actually compare HomeAway's free cash flow conversion to other companies here, Expedia, Priceline, Shutterfly, TripAdvisor, you get the idea, other 
online travel related companies and find that HomeAway pretty much leads the pack. Expedia is slightly higher at 125%, but the rest are all lower. Now by itself, this may or may not mean anything, but often people will argue that companies that convert EBITDA into free cash flow at a higher percentage are deserving of a higher valuation multiple. So that's one way you could use this. You could also use it to develop your own investment thesis. One example is the seven days in case study that I just showed you earlier. In a lot of cases, an investment or a leverage buyout will work because of a company's free cash flow generation and its ability to improve that over time. So with seven days in, for example, the reason their free cash flow conversion goes up from negative territory to more like 50 or 60% is because they are switching to a franchise business model, sort of like what McDonald's does and what many other hotel and restaurant chains do. Essentially, over time, they're moving to managed hotels and they are not going to have to pay for the construction. They're not going to have to pay for as much for the management. They're essentially giving away or making other people pay to be able to use their brand name and their resources. And then they're just collecting a royalty fee for anyone who actually uses it. And in our case study presentation and in our investment recommendation, we point out that the whole reason the math works and the whole reason we, why we get to an acceptable internal rate of return here is because their capital expenditures as a percent of revenue are falling substantially. And at the same time, they are converting substantially more of their EBITDA into free cash flow, meaning that the business becomes less capital intensive and generates far more free cash flow into the future. So you can certainly use the analysis to support that type of argument, especially when the business is undergoing a shift, such as going from all owned and operating locations to the franchise model. And then the third way you can use it is to look at it along with credit stats and ratios to figure out how much debt a company can take on. For example, let's say that the comparable companies have a leverage ratio of 4x on average, or for the median, let's say. And on average, the free cash flow conversion is around 50%. But then your company has a free cash flow conversion of 75%. So the implication here may be that even though the median debt to EBITDA is 4x, since our company generates so much more free cash flow, maybe it can afford to take on more than 4x debt to EBITDA, and maybe lenders will be more comfortable with that. So in this seven days in case study, for example, the numbers here are quite a bit different. We generally have much lower numbers overall, but one of the things you realize is that one of the reasons why we have lower debt to EBITDA ratios here is that the company's free cash flow generation wasn't spectacular to begin with. If we look down and see that it's projected to become a lot stronger over time, then perhaps we could go back to this and say that they could afford to take on more debt than what we've originally assumed here. So those are a couple ways in which you could use this type of analysis. In short, to do a quick recap and summary now, with free cash flow conversion, you want to see how much of a company's EBITDA gets converted into free cash flow. Higher percentages are generally more positive if they're actually sustainable and they're supported by net income growth, capex growth, growth in other items like taxes that you would expect to see over time, and even something like working capital and improving working capital management if that's actually sustainable. You can use free cash flow conversion to compare peer companies and valuation multiples and see if one company might be overvalued or undervalued. You can use it to support your leverage buyout thesis for a company or investment thesis in a company. And you can also use it in conjunction with credit stats and ratios to see if a company might be able to take on more debt or less debt than other companies that it is similar to but has a different free cash flow conversion profile from. So that's it for this tutorial. I hope you learned a bit about this concept and now have a better idea of some of the trade-offs of EBITDA and free cash flow and how these metrics are related.